Hey, what's up guys and gals? My name is Rick9G. Thank you so much for joining me today. And you will all notice that we have a special guest on the show. And you may ask, who is this man? And we're gonna surround the show with a ring of steel and figure out who he is or else we're gonna send him to the Russian front. This is my very, very special guest, Lyle Kane. Now for you guys and gals who are very big fans of Hogan's Heroes and even shows from the 60s and even movies, you'll probably know that last name. Um, and he is the son of the amazing, the very talented Howard Kane. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Um, we really do appreciate that you come on here because let me tell you, we've talked before, but I'm gonna say it again, people are huge, huge fans of your father, of his work. And let me tell you, it is amazing seeing you, that everyone can see you, because you are the exact image of your father. Yes, uh, I, I, I've come to, uh, come to appreciate that over time. So this is really exciting to have you on the show. I have so many questions to ask you on behalf of the fans, of people who love, as I mentioned, the work of your father. But before we get into your dad, just a little bit, we, I want to talk a little bit about you. Let's um, just dive in deep to who Lyle Kane is. If you can tell us just a little bit about yourself, whatever you'd like to share, anything possibly about, maybe not about your dad yet, but um, your family, just your any siblings, anything like that. Uh, well, I was an only child. It was my mother and my father. Um, I uh, lived and grew up in Studio City. Uh, my mother was also was also in in theater. She was an actress. She did Broadway. She sang opera. She played piano. She was a very talented, lovely lady. My mom and I play music myself. My father got me on the guitar when I was six years old. My dad played. Some people don't know, but he played uh, Appalachian style traditional banjo and blues guitar and he got me on guitar when I was six and I would back him up when I was a kid you know we'd go out and play and perform and I continued to play guitar ever since I've got uh, you know a day job like everyone else but music is my my passion that's that's the at the heart of everything that I do and love the uh, two CDs of music which I'm going to release in the very near future they'll be up on Bandcamp and then eventually once we have all our ducks in order, they're going to be on a number of platforms. It'll be available uh, to people. And uh, that is also my way of honoring my dad because the, there's two CDs and the first one opens with him, an excerpt of him playing uh, his fretless banjo nice. and segues and it, and it transitions into my song. And, uh, and I wanted to, uh, I tied it together with him because in the beginning he's playing the banjo at the end of this instrumental, it ends with his banjo played backwards and me playing over it. Oh, wow. And this was like a way of uh, That's really cool. representing him. On the second CD, there's a song about my mother that I want because I wanted to represent her as well. Mm -hmm. song because I wanted to write the song. That's cool. I hope uh, it'll bring joy to the world like my father did. So they just showered you with, with acting, theater, like the arts, right? Music. It must have been pretty amazing to grow up in that. And in Studio City, like basically Hollywood. <laughs> part of it and and yeah being exposed to um to musical theater and uh you know my dad's blues records and folk records and uh and, and hearing them play hearing my mom play piano my dad also played boogie woogie piano <laughs> and, uh, over the years he didn't do it as often and he'd get frustrated because he expected to be as good every time he sat down but oh, but he, he had style on the he, he had a you know, he had his hands in everything a little bit. Very talented man. That's amazing. We're going to talk, of course, more about him. But I've done a video on his, uh, I called it his secret because essentially, I mean, yes, you would know and some fans know, but it's not widely known that, you know, he played the banjo. He had that bluegrass type music affinity. He loved that type music. And it's kind of strange to have that image of, let's say, Major Hockstetter playing the banjo, right? I've always had that. And I was like, no way. This can't be. <laughs> takes a lot of people by surprise, but he was actually, uh, he competed, he, he won, I believe it's 29 trophies at, at Banjo and Fiddle oh, contests. And he uh, performed professionally, we, we did uh, some concerts. And uh, it was actually it was actually a traditional banjo, which is different. It's a claw hammer style, which was 
uh, created in the Appalachian Mountains for people who had arthritis. They couldn't they couldn't oh. they couldn't uh, play the banjo correctly or in the traditional style. So they created this on this style that that has a different sound and um, you know mountain music they call it. Right. And, and he was very into the folk music scene. Awesome. Oh my gosh. This this is already exciting because, I mean, we have talked about this a little bit, but I know that some people would have heard this for the first time watching the show for so long. Um, as, as I mentioned, your dad not only did Hogan's Heroes, he did other shows, and I'll mention them in just a little bit. But tell us more about your dad. Tell us more about who Howard Cain was. Um, he told us a little bit about his, his musical um, talents and, and his banjo. Uh, maybe uh, you want to mention also a little bit, we talked about um, him and Bob Crane. So Bob Crane played played Robert Hogan. And so, yeah, a little bit about him. Uh, well, he played drums, and my dad played banjo. Werner Klemper played uh, violin. Yeah, so he was uh, Colonel Klink. Werner right, Klemper. my brother was a classical composer. So my dad, uh, they'd each go to their dressing rooms in between takes. My father would play his banjo in his dressing room. Um, Bob Crane was a jazz drummer. He actually had a drum kit set up there, and he played play his drums the styles were too too di you know different for, for them to be compatible but i actually was reading recently uh that my dad tried to get warner klemper to play some banjo music with him but it was just you know it, like coming from a classical classically trained violin background he, he couldn't he didn't <laughs> he didn't adapt too well to that We've we've also talked a little bit about you know what else your dad enjoyed. You said he was a big fan of like classic movies as well, like Marx Brothers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, he took me to see the Marx Brothers uh, Duck Soup. He said that was his favorite Marx Brothers movie. Wow. I don't believe I'd seen the Marx Brothers before then, and so that was a delight. He also uh, um, was very into Japanese kabuki theater. No so way. He, okay. So he really liked. Um, Kurosawa movies, uh, Seven Samurai, and so forth. So uh, one one of those movies is called Rashomon. Mm -hmm. Father had an expression, "Life is Rashomon," and I n never quite understood. He explained it to me, but he took me to see a community theater version of it, explaining that uh, everybody sees things from a different perspective, and that's what the that's what Rashomon is about. And and so that he would make reference to that. He was a trained Shakespearean okay. actor. Um, an interesting aside about that is that he, um, I remember an occasion where someone brought their daughter to him to ask about becoming a, you know, getting into the, the movie industry, becoming an actress. And he said, I know what you want me to say. And you know, that you, that you should get headshots and get an agent and get out there and audition. He said, but what I'm going to tell you is to learn to cold read Shakespeare and then come back and we'll talk. Oh my gosh. <laughs> He well, that shows how dedicated he was to his craft, and he was trying to give her the best advice that he yes. thought. And you know, that was it's um, kind of similar to you know the movie Karate Kid. The little kid wants to come in, and he's like, the first thing he wants to do is beat someone up. And he's like, no, you must learn, Daniel son. You must go and wax on, wax off. And I don't want to do this, right? It's kind of the same advice. You got me washing cars. What's going on? Here? Yeah, exactly. I really want to honor the memory and the work of individuals like your father who brought us so many laughs who continue to bring us these laughs after so many years decades he also did good things for people who were maybe sick yeah we had, we had a an experience where we went with a bus full of uh I, there was actors uh, henry what's his name henry winkler was there the fonz. and some, some uh the fonz yes and some um soap opera actors uh, and actresses and we went to this hospital and these kids were in very poor shape uh, um, and that and and we went there and everyone went there to visit with them it was christmas time nice. to give them christmas cheer and in our case we played banjo and guitar and entertain entertain these kids and it was an intense experience but a a, a moving a moving experience i'm really glad that he that he he wanted to share that with me and you know to to give something back to people that's that's wonderful because i just to think that of course that was his work his art his craft what he did to entertain us a lot of work goes into that a lot of study a lot of 
rehearsal. I, I, I make videos on that stuff all the time. How it's, I mean, we watch, what, 26 and a half minutes of something that's funny, but that takes a long time to do and, and several cuts and, and heartache and frustration and the product comes out, right? That's, that's his work. But then in his spare time, he went, and continue to give to others. I think that's awesome. That's wonderful. Beyond that, he also was in all of the acting unions, SAG, AFTRA, uh, Actors' Equity, which I believe is theater, and he was actively involved in, in uh, you know, the rights of actors, helping actors, helping the underdog. Right. That is even, even uh, the civil rights movement. He was he was in marches for for equal rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, involved in, involved in many many different aspects, including uh, in one instance he brought uh, Cesar Chavez to our temple oh, and wow. to speak, and uh, was friends with Cesar Chavez, and I got to meet him, and that was, you know, that was like meeting a celebrity for me. I mean, that was an amazing experience as well. Of course, that's very important because I mean, the city of LA is pretty much like dedicated to Cesar Chavez. There's busts and statues of him everywhere like this. So, I mean, there's a lot of advantages, you know, to the life that you led and, and who you had as a father. I think that's wonderful. It's true, I was exposed to many things. In fact, my father would say that you should, uh, he, his friends were not all just in the same industry as him. He felt it was important to have friends in different walks of life. Otherwise you're closing yourself off. And he, uh, and he, instill that in me as well one more thing i really wanted to talk about was your father was actually in the military but not the german military he was in the american military can you tell us a little bit about that yes he actually served in the navy he was petty officer third class a uh, radio man he actually and i remember him trying to teach me morse code because <laughs> he was actually uh and that was yet another language that he knew wow. it, they, it was from 1945 to 1946 on the USS George K. McKenzie, uh, third class petty officer, but first class radio man in the Japanese theater. So that was World War II on the Japanese front. There was a bit of tie-in to his character, obviously a different side and everything, but did have that real life experience of serving. I have a lot of viewers who are actually veterans. So yes. um, it's it's good that we mentioned that and honor the fact that he did serve. So that's very good. Yes. All right, so let's get into this more the character of course like i mentioned he played many parts and we can even talk about some of the shows well actually let's do that what are some of the shows that he was on he had parts and then maybe we'll we'll kind of get into hockstetter after that special mention would be twilight zone he did a episode of twilight zone called he's alive i believe and with dennis hopper yeah and um he did uh, outer limits he did get smart he actually did a a get smart and then three part get smart as yeah. well, where he played two different characters. Right. And uh, there was movies, 1776, the musical, yeah. um, From the Terrace with Paul Newman, um, Pay or Die with Ernest Borgnine, um, and Alvarez Kelly, Richard wow. Widmark. Wow. Nice. And he also was in uh, Judgment at Nuremberg with Richard Widmark pinnacle of what at least people know him for that in my opinion it's i mean his best work he is one of the characters who i tune into the show to watch him right everyone thinks you're here to watch hogan's heroes right the group which they're great but then when we see the gestapo coming in and we see hockstar coming i'm like oh what's he gonna do you know and i think that's some of, i mean i'm a fan that's why i can say it like that and i think people kind of resonate with what i'm saying um that's tell wonderful. us it's wonderful. I'm finding that more and more that that people really enjoyed his work. I, you know, I I'm partial to him uh, for my reasons, but I'm finding that everyone really uh, derived pleasure from seeing his character show up and and uh, uh, you know he was the upset <laughs> he <would> come <laughs> in and, and stir things up and and uh, he, yeah people really love him. I went and visited the set with him on a couple occasions. Oh my gosh! Sometimes. The indoor set, sometimes the outdoor set. I met the actors. They uh, they would, you know, hang out socially. I remember an occasion where we went all the whole group of them went to a Chinese restaurant together, and uh, in our neighborhood, um, I would go there, and uh, each one had their little way of 
they were all very warm and kind to me. I specifically remember wow. Richard Dawson would tickle me. Uh, oh my gosh! Or, no way. Or he would kiss me on the cheeks, you know, French style. Wait, who would do that? The kissing on the cheek. Robert Clary, Robert, okay. Clary, or Robert Clary. LeBeau, yeah. And um, uh, John Banner was dressed in a specific episode as uh, Santa Claus. So oh yes, his knee did the whole Santa Claus routine with me. Yes, wow. Um, Larry Hovis was a really nice man. I don't remember specifically, but I was there. My dad used to joke that the first time I saw snow, it came out of a hose. <laughs> yes, the, the fake set. snow on sets, yeah. And then they'd be doing scene. I remember them doing a scene where they were stomping their feet, and I asked him, why are they doing that? He said, Dude, you know, when you're cold, you stomp your feet. No, yeah, th this was filmed, and I've, I've made videos on this, as so some people will know, but if you don't, you should check them out. But... Yes, this was all not filmed in Germany. Obviously, it was all filmed in Los Angeles, California, two separate locations for indoor and outdoor, um, 10, 10 or so miles apart, 10 to 15 miles apart. And yeah, so they had to use fake snow in the hot California climate, and they had to pretend like they were freezing in, in, in cold Germany, which is... Through the secret passages, they come up from the log, but the log would be outdoors, and the uh, barracks would be indoors, for example. They create this world, and I made... A video just on the outside of it but you're right like just the fact of how they connect that is just so so amazing um can you tell us a little bit more we've talked a little bit about it before in terms of uh you mentioned so you married you mentioned larry hovis that he was there on set you remember him you remember john banner schultz um, yes. as santa claus you remember mm -hmm. lebeau of course louis lebeau the french man uh, robert clary who's still alive at the point in this video and right. but you didn't mention Bob Crane or Robert Crane. Um, was he there? And how did he interact with everyone? Because I made videos on how he was just a little different in that sense. He was he was different. He was the star, which yeah. uh, separated him to a degree. He was more aloof, less sociable. On, when um, they'd have parties or get-togethers, he generally or or as I say, you know, getting together for dinner. Uh, Werner Klemper was there. All the people we just spoke about were there. He generally didn't socialize with the rest of them. He was uh, more con on the conservative side, which was another aspect that kept him apart from the rest. And uh, and then we find we find after time that there was a specific reason for that. Yeah, he was he, he sort of had his own little world that kept him separate from the rest of them. What I will tell you is that that uh, Robert Clary. Um, he had a he had a number on his arm, and he would never speak about it in those days. He didn't want to talk about it. But later on, he became outspoken about it that he was actually, as a child, he was in a concentration camp, mm -hmm. and so he had a cable TV show uh, where he he spoke about the, the spoke about that experience. And uh, on one occasion, he had my father and Leon Askin on the show, right. and he asked them how they felt being Jewish playing uh german roles yeah and uh and my father i remember i can tell you my father's response was that uh he felt he brought realism to the show because his character was was very harsh and scary as well i mean yeah. managed to somehow be funny and scary yeah at the same time or uh, you know opposing opposing times and um so he he felt that that was important to bring the realism to the show that you know he was an SS officer mm -hmm. and you know one to be reckoned with. In fact, he's a major. A lot of these people had a um, higher rank than he did, mm -hmm. but he was intimidating. Yeah, the fact that he was in the SS made him made everyone kind of a little bit scared of him. While they were like, "Wait, but I'm a higher rank," and that was part of the fun of the show. You know that you have a general Burkhalter, you know, part yeah. of the Wehrmacht, and. And then you have, you know, a major down here and, you know, the general was a little bit scared, but then he's like, but I'm a general too. So that was kind of the back and forth that they always had, which was just... Mike was cowering, you know, he was a, he was a colonel and he was cowering from him. Yes, <laughs> I think that was great. And you know what, too, your father was rather short compared to everyone else. And he still had that commanding presence where it was like, oh my gosh. You know, yeah. they were all scared. They were all taller. Leon Askin was, you know, rather large. And you have uh, Werner, who was large as well. You have Schultz, who was huge, right? And then here comes this man who is just like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> and, all of them. yeah, all of them were bigger than him, but he was larger than life. I've made around 30 or more videos on Hogan's Heroes, and I get this all the time in the comments. 
Um, and it's something I'm glad you touched upon, and that is how could they even make a show like this? And, and I will get it. It's so disrespectful to the Jewish community and, and what is going on and so forth. And I'm almost like, I feel like I can't answer. You know, I'm not Jewish myself, but I, someone like your father who was Jewish, correct? Yes. Um, and most of the cast was, you know, John Banner, Werner Klemper, um, and, and I believe Leon Askin as well. And you mentioned Robert Clary. And, and the producers and the writers. Exactly. I mean, it was deliberate that it was an American, you know, a prison camp. It was deliberate that it was Americans and, you know, English and French prisoners and, and war prisoners rather than, you know, the other option, which wouldn't have been very amusing at all. I think it was cathartic for people to see Germans as buffoons. And I know that there are people who were actually, you know, victims of, of the Holocaust or or concentration camps who, who enjoyed it and laugh. I've been told that people who their parents watched it and laughed at it because it gave them some release. Do you watch the show? I have a suspicion you do because of course um, our previous chats, but do you ever, you know, your father of course passed away I believe in 1994. Right. And uh, so, do you watch him? Do you watch Hogan Serials? Maybe have a specific show, movie of his that you do watch, if you do, and, and can you tell us more about that? I do. I watch Hogan's Heroes. I watch the other movies. Um, for me, it is also cathartic. It's a pleasure because a lot of people, when you're, you lose your parents, that you don't generally get to see them again or see them walk and talk and interact. And, you know, I get to, I, I have that opportunity I have a nice little collection of his the DVDs of the movies he was in. Um, I have amazing photos. In fact, I've created a group called on Facebook called the Howard Kane Major Hoxbetter Group. I'm going to actually link it in the description of the video, the top link. If you guys uh -huh. just click on that, it'll go to his um, it'll go to his page, so you can check out the cool pictures. He has so many cool things that you need you need to join this page. And it's really been a pleasure because I'm now uh, friends and interacting with 600 of his fans so far. Actually, I'm, I'm 700. We just we just wow, uh, nice. broke 700, and uh, it's amazing to see how people respond to him. Um, and they, the reason I brought that up is because they are much better versed in Hogan's Heroes than I am. They bring up very they they really know their Hogan's Heroes. Yeah. Yes, it's amazing how many times I, he ran into people that I saw on TV and had no idea that they were friends. Uh, in one instance, we were on Ventura Boulevard in Studio City, walking down the street, and uh, he ran into Ross Martin, who played Artemis Gordon in Wild Wild West. And Wild Wild West was one of my favorite childhood shows. Mm -hmm. And I'm just sitting there thinking, oh my God, my dad knows Ross Martin. This is amazing. Uh, my dad was good friends with Ed Asner. Mm -hmm. and I always had very memorable interactions with Ed, and wow. uh, I remember on in one on one occasion I met uh, Al Lewis, who was uh, Grandpa in the Munsters. Yeah, it's like one of those things where it's like a little kid, a little boy. What do they want to do? Right, meet the people who are on TV, and then you get to see them, and and it's just like it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't compute. Right. And now right. you wish you were back there. <laughs> oh, there was also Carol O'Connor. From oh. all in the family, I when I was we were in uh, Georgia one time and uh, wound up on a set of the show he was in at that time. Alan Hill, isn't that his name? Alan, Alan oh, yeah. Hill. So Alan Hill Jr., the skipper from Gilligan's Island, right? Yes. Yes. I remember me going somewhere on our way somewhere and stopping by his house, and this was this was normal. This was a normal part of my childhood. It was yeah. really a pleasure. Amazing, and that's cool because right, you were in Studio City, and I believe. Um, Alan Hill Jr. had a restaurant um, in kind of South Hollywood, the South Hollywood area. Um, it was like a lobster, a lobster restaurant or stuff. So he was in the area. Yeah. Do you have a favorite scene or, or just maybe even something from Hogan's Heroes that maybe you looked at and were like, let me just look at this. Let me just study this. Let me just see my dad acting. Or maybe you lost yourself in it or you were like, oh my gosh, this is a great scene. I was, because I'm his son. I wasn't sure if I was being subjective about him, so I'd watch him and uh, be like, "Wow, he really was good." You know, it's not just it's not just me. And now yeah. I have a lot of confirmation that that's the truth. And I'd love to. I just I 
can't tell you the uh, correct name. As I say, I'm not as well versed in it as a lot of his fans. But the one where he's trying to decipher the Wellington cipher. Yes, that's my one of my favorite scenes. Yeah, that's my that's one of my favorite episode because it features him and uh, the interaction between him and Richard Dawson is just fantastic in that. And uh, so that yeah, that's a really memorable one for me. The snowman. Snowman uh, one. Yeah. Like they like people say who enjoy his work, he he just come on and bring the bring the scene to the next level. He played originally um, a different character. I believe his name was Major Keitel, and so it wasn't it it wasn't Hochstetter, and right. and so he he kind of looks a little bit like you now. He didn't have a mustache at that time, you know. He had like a different cap and so forth. But then he he morphed. He didn't really morph, but he they kind of created the character of Hochstetter. Literally created the character of Hochstetter for him. He did a character in the first season as you just mentioned, a second character in the second season, and they liked him and wanted to uh, ma incorporate him into the show and actually created Hochstetter for my father to play. That's incredible. And the fact that what I loved is, how can you love an SS officer? It's impossible. But then your dad was, you were able to do it. And I always think that part of the genius of his just portrayal was the fact that you loved him, but then you were also terrified of him, but then you also believed him. And at times he was even one-upping the, the heroes. That is like, he was above the plan. He knew what was going on. He had control, but then the heroes right at the last moment, they would get the upper hand. Right. So he never quite, you know, figured it out. He never quite got there, but he was always so close. Yeah. In the end, he, he always wound up befuddled and they always, they always pulled one over on him. And that was that was the uh, that was the joy and humor of it. Now, at the end of his life, um, I think you mentioned this just very moving story about his funeral that I think really speaks to who he was, not just as an actor, with someone. Hey, let's just watch an episode, and you know, I think it speaks more about the lasting impression that he left on people in his community in the world. Could you tell us about that? Yes, there's actually two things. One is. Before the rabbi who spoke was was friends with my dad, um, they were close. But he asked questions beforehand, and one of his questions, one one thing he found out was that my dad uh, was born in Nashville, Tennessee. That he was he was a uh, from Nashville, Tennessee. He he moved to New York when he was twelve. His father said, "If you want to be an actor, you have to lose the Southern accent." And in the process of that is where he came. He became so well versed with dialects he could do 32 dialects oh my gosh i didn't and, uh, know that and any combination you could throw a combination at him and, and he could do it for you and um so he the rabbi uh got up there and opened with there was a jew from tennessee a banjo picking jew from tennessee <laughs> and then that was it i was done i completely yeah. lost it when he when he said that yeah i actually wrote something about my dad and then I've written a, I had written a song about my dad. Mm -hmm. uh, wow! That heard. I mean, it was a song yeah. that had existed beforehand. And I actually read my thing about him and played a song. Was able to play a song, the song for him uh, at the funeral. And then wow. the funeral ended with um, what they call an actor's applaud or, or a, a final curtain, where there was uh, two hundred people there, uh, primarily actors. And they all applauded when the casket went by, and that was very moving. I think everyone kind of understands this, but maybe they don't know how to put it into words. I don't know if I could put it into words, but I always feel that these shows, these you know, actors like your father, create a magic, a magic that is captured on, on film. We could see it, and I could see it today, and then I could watch it a week from now. And it'll still cause similar emotions in me. It'll cause me to laugh or it'll cause me to, oh my goodness, that was so funny or whatever it would be. Um, do you think that part of his legacy was just being able to make that magic with the other actors and just, just that final product? Absolutely. It immortalizes them. And yeah. uh, I, I said before, he, my dad is a little piece of history, Absolutely. a little piece of Hollywood history for, for certain. And uh, so he, he went through the whole evolution of uh, radio, Broadway, stage, um, television, and movies. Movies as well, yep. 
he was with Lucio Ball. He was in a few episodes of the Lucy Show. I have to mention that because Lucio Ball is pretty big on my channel. Um, right. I would even suggest people to watch that. In one of them, he played an art dealer. So he had like an art business and Lucy went in there. She got a few supplies and so forth. No German accent, obviously. Very different. It did look like him, but he was, you know, obviously costume maker. Well, not costume, but he had different wardrobe and so forth. And in another one, he also played, I believe it was uh, Mr. Mooney's kind of assistant, and, and it was like a, a politics episode, so he was kind of like his campaign manager. Put himself in that role. He was very Americanized. Like, he did not appear like Hoxtetter at all. So if you guys have not seen that, if you haven't seen his other roles, his movies, check him out. I think you will absolutely, like, love his versatility. You said 32 dialects. I mean, who who can you say can do that today? That's so rare. Do you want to say anything in particular to, you know, the people on Facebook or even just his fans in general who love his work and really still watch it today? I do. I thank them so much. They've created this. Uh, it's great. I, I mean, I maybe I, I, I like to think I set the mood, but it's created this great atmosphere having all these people interact and talk about him and express their their affection towards him and uh, i feel like i have a huge family now it's been really wonderful um and i do appreciate he appreciated um being in, acknowledged he actually corresponded with fans by mail he would have photos in the back of his car ready to go if he met someone oh, sign wow. the photo do a little uh, who is this man for them you yeah. know um he was happy to have that and i think he would be so overjoyed by this by this whole thing you know the the internet wasn't yeah up to speed like it is now when when he was still around yeah and um i think you'd be quite amazed i mean i'm quite amazed I really am i want to thank you so much lyle this is i mean we've we've been preparing this for a long time a lot of work goes into this because you know we want to we want to make sure we get the good questions that people want to know and so forth and we try our hardest to do that we try to set this up and a lot of this information is exclusive here. There's, I believe you've given a couple interviews here and there, but I made sure that a lot of this stuff is like we dig deep and just share as much as we can. So I thank you for sharing all that personal stuff with us and putting it out there in the public for people that just literally follow your dad's work to this day, decades after, and still love it. Like if it was that day when it came out. It's my pleasure. You know, my dad, he was proud of me. Uh, he would carry around, he had a uh, well, it, he called it a garzink. It was a it was a bag full of stuff that that he'd carry around. It included like uh, cards I'd written for him, poems I'd written, no way. Wow. photos. He would he would show them off to people. Look, this is my son. Oh and my now gosh. I have the opportunity to to be proud of him, of course, and, and give something back to him. And I'm just overjoyed by the reaction of people towards my father and his work. You're making this channel what I always want it to be, a memory to these individuals and for us to just be entertained and joy. And I feel that if we keep talking about him, he's here. He's still here. He's he's still with us. And so thank you so much. My pleasure. I say I say that we keep people alive in our memories and in the way we treat each other. And so that validates what you just said as well. Absolutely. So thank you so much again. Thank you everyone for watching, for supporting this, for watching this entire video. If you watched up to this point, we really do appreciate it. If you do want to see more content like this, um, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button and to subscribe and check out Lyle's um, Facebook page below. Like I said, he has a lot of personal pictures like with him and his dad, his little boy growing up, uh, different roles that he did, like behind the scenes pictures that are his. And he's been also um, just very gracious so that I could put some of those on here just as a little teaser. I won't put many. I want you to go and, and check his work out because he puts a lot of work into that page. So thank you so much. We'll see you next time. And don't forget, guys and gals, most importantly, as always, to be hopeful. Thank you so much to all my supporters on Patreon, especially my diamond tier patrons. Tommy G, Citizen Kane 359, Grace U, Sally N, David D, and Ricky. You can find exclusive content on Patreon at different tiers. Go ahead and check it out and thank you so much.